Good evening, everyone. I have heard Myrna Goldberg's name, our guest tonight, from a diverse group of people for years. All have been entertained and educated, regardless of the subject or venue. Locally, Myrna has been a longtime teacher at FAU Lifelong Learning. And what I learned at dinner tonight is she was the very first faculty person hired by FIU for Lifelong Learning about 20 years ago. You can read the rest of her history on your program, but it's been a joy and a delight to get to know her by phone and over dinner tonight. And I, like you, look forward to learn about Eleanor Roosevelt through Myrna's unique style. So let's welcome Eleanor Roosevelt. My name is Anna Eleanor Roosevelt Roosevelt. And my place in history can best be described by these words. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. My life can occupy volumes and volumes of textual material. But my life was a lot more than what has been written about me, suggested about me, supposed about me, and created about me. I was the child of Elliot Roosevelt, and my mother was Anna Roosevelt. That's why I was to be known as Eleanor. My mother did not think highly of me. I was not beautiful. I was not brilliant. I was not especially skilled in any special field. And in fact, my mother, if you can picture her, would introduce me to her friends. Come, meet my daughter, Eleanor. We call her Granny for short. <laughs> My mother would always suggest that she could do anything better than I could. We did not bond. We did not become a typical mother-daughter relationship. My father, that was a different story. I adored my father, Elliot. The problem was my father, Elliot, was an alcoholic. And so much of the time he was forbidden from entering the house. He was forbidden from associating with me. And yet I cherished those moments when he would scoop me up hold me in his arms, call me Little Nell, and tell me how much he loved me. Those were words of delight for me. But they were to be compared with experiences like the night he came home and said, oh, Little Nell, jump into my arms and come with me. I'm going to go to my club. Come along. And I eagerly went along. When we got to the club, 
The doorman said, you do know, Mr. Roosevelt, that your young daughter cannot come into the club. This is a men's club. Well, he said, we will sit her out here on the stoop. Keep an eye on her, and I will pick her up on my way home. Two hours later, the doorman woke me up and said, Missy, I have a car coming to pick you up and take you home. Your father was carried out just a little while ago. So I did not have a happy, exuberant childhood. And as a result of the lack of maternal love, I became so close to my father, to his memory, and to his life. My father and my mother would pass away by the time I was 11 years old. Not many people know that I was an orphan from an early age. And who was going to take care of me? Along came my maternal grandmother, Anna Hall. And she was to be in charge of me and my brother, Hall. She didn't know how to take care of her own children. So how could she possibly take care of me and my brother? Once she moved us in, she turned us over to the servants. And I also had no perception of what true love from a parent or relative would be. As a result, I tried to excel at school. I studied and studied anything and everything I could read and digest. I became especially interested in French culture, French literature, French writing, and I kept working as hard as I could so that maybe Grandmama would note that I was an exceptional student. But yet, I remained unhappy. And when I first entered my teens, my Grandmama said to me, Eleanor, I think I am going to send you to school in England. You will live there. You will receive a fine education. Mademoiselle Silvestre, who is the headmistress of Allenswood School, has assured me that this will be a perfect place for you. And so, I was shipped off to Allenswood to board, to get my education, and to learn about the culture of Europe. And if anyone wanted to get to the heart of my upbringing, they would have to admit Mademoiselle Silvestre is the woman who made me what I was to become. She took this introverted, quiet child and turned me into a well-spoken individual. She would say to me, Eleanor, let's go to the continent for a few days, make the reservations, plan where we shall eat, Take charge for me. And that was how 
I learned, I suppose you'd call it, my first traits of leadership. It would also be Mademoiselle Silvestre who would discuss the arts with me and who opened up to me the pleasure of speaking, voicing an opinion, and proving an opinion. I loved the classics. I loved Allenswood. And I suppose I would have stayed in England for as long as I possibly could, perhaps even taking a place on the faculty of the school after I had completed my own education. But one day, Mademoiselle Silvestre sat me down and said, Eleanor, you must go back to New York. I don't want to, I said. I have no wish to return to New York. And Mademoiselle Silvestre spoke to me very frankly. Eleanor, you are a Roosevelt. You are a member of society. And you are expected to take part in the debutante season. Me, a debutante? No, mademoiselle. I do not wish to do that. But she persisted. It is your duty as a Roosevelt to have a coming out party and to attend a debutante season. And that was how I left Mademoiselle Silvestre in tears, came back to New York where I did enter the debutante social season. I was not comfortable. I was too tall to dance with the young men. I didn't really know how to dance. I did not like dinners or luncheons or picnics or teas. I was most uncomfortable. And one night, I was to attend a function at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel of that era. And I found myself sitting in a corner all alone. Everybody had a dance card. Mine was not filled. I sat there. And I sat there, I do not know how long, until suddenly I looked up, and there, standing before me, was my cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, my ninth cousin. I had not spent much time with him, but I knew him. He pulled up a chair. Eleanor? Can we talk? And we talked that night. I learned of his ambitions. Oh, Eleanor, I'm going to be president one day. Well, how do you know? I asked him. I know because my mother told me so. <laughs> we talked for hours. We did not dance. We did not partake of the food and drink. And by the time the evening was ending, Franklin said to me, I don't know you very well, Eleanor, but you are exactly the kind of woman I need. And that was how my heart flipped, and I became interested in Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
we began to see each other. And one day, Franklin, who did nothing without the consent of his mother, Sarah, decided to tell his mother that he was courting me and that he wanted me to become his wife. When he went to tell his mother, I would later learn she had fits. She could not understand how her darling, her beloved, the child she had sworn would be great because he had been saved at birth from dying from lack of oxygen. Franklin, you can have any woman your heart desires. Why would you pick Eleanor? She's not a beauty, and you could do so much better. My mother, Franklin told me, did not know that Franklin had been in love with a young woman named Alice. But that romance had been discontinued because Alice's mother thought, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who is he? He will not amount to anything. And once Franklin told his mother of his intentions with me, she put her foot down and she said, no, Franklin, promise me you'll take a year. I will send you on a cruise. And when you travel the world, perhaps you will forget about Eleanor. And he interjected, but Mama, if I do still prefer Eleanor, will you give me your blessing when I return from my journey? And Sarah agreed. Franklin went off on the cruise for a year. And when he returned, he informed his mother he wanted to marry Eleanor. Our wedding was a beautiful society affair, but I, the bride, was not the center of attraction. Why? Because the person who was to walk me down the aisle was my uncle, Teddy Roosevelt. And he stole the scene right from beneath my feet. And he was the one who was applauded, who was cheered. And I was just like a statue, walking, holding on to his arm. I should have used that as a forerunner for what my married life was to be, for it would be Mama Sarah who would take over control of our lives. She moved into a new home in New York, and she had a house built right next door for Franklin and me to live in. She built a nursery as I started to have children, I would have six pregnancies. Mama would furnish the house. She would buy the clothes for the children. She would hire the servants. I was nothing but wallpaper. I used to sit at my dressing table and regret what my life had become. I was certainly not an independent young housewife. And then, as time went on, circumstances became 
even worse. For Franklin had ambitions. He wanted to be exactly like Teddy Roosevelt. He wanted to be assistant head of the Department of the Navy. He wanted to go on to be a governor, to be a senator, to be president because his mother had said he could be. And so it was that I lived not in solitude, but in my own quiet world until Franklin, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, was told, you will move to Washington, D.C. You will have a different address, and you will be starting your political career. I was overjoyed. I would at last be out of the arms of my mother-in-law. I would be in my own home. I would even be in my own kitchen, which I had never really done. We moved to Washington, and Franklin's schedule, this is over a period of time, became so busy that I needed help to keep my calendar straight. And I was told, Eleanor, hire a social secretary. And so I hired a woman whose family were friends of the Roosevelts, and she would work on a daily basis at our home in Washington. From the moment Lucy Page Mercer walked into my house, Franklin was to take a deep interest in her. I would never know it, but Franklin and Lucy, after hours, would take walks throughout Washington, would visit mutual friends. I suspected nothing. I had no idea of this budding romance that through the years would blossom. Franklin continued to rise up through the ranks and during World War I, he was told, you must go to France. You must go to inspect the military. Pack up your needed belongings, for we are going to take you there now. And Eleanor need not come with you to a war zone. So Franklin left and went to Europe. He became ill on that trip. He had the flu, he had severe sore throats and bronchial difficulties. It was decided to send him home. He should no longer stay overseas. Franklin returned home, and when he came home, I, being the dutiful wife, unpacked his suitcase. And in his suitcase, I found a stack of love letters from Lucy Page Mercer. I knew then that Franklin had found someone else to admire. And what did I do? I went right to Franklin, even before he got better. And I told him, I will give you a divorce. And Franklin agreed. But before we sign papers, Franklin said, I must tell Mama. So he went 
to tell Sarah of his intentions. And when he informed her that he was going to divorce me, Sarah shouted out at her son for perhaps the only time in her life, you will not divorce Eleanor. And Franklin, for the first time, defied his mother. But Mama, that's what I want to do. My son, you will not. Number one, you are a Roosevelt and a Delano, and you will not bring this shame to our family. And Franklin said, I can handle that, Mama. I want to divorce Eleanor. And then it was that Sarah said, Franklin, if you persist in your desire to divorce Eleanor, I must tell you now that I will withdraw giving the home you love, Springwood, to you upon my passing. And Franklin wasn't moved by that either. But then Sarah pulled her trump card and she said, son, if you insist on divorcing Eleanor, I will cut you off without one red cent. And since Sarah handled all the finances for the family and handled any monies that Franklin used, he paused. And he paused a little bit longer. And then he agreed, I will not divorce Eleanor. Then we will make an agreement, Mama interjected. You and Eleanor, she was making the decisions for me, will live as husband and wife in name only. Eleanor can do as she pleases, and you can pursue your career, but you will be Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, and you will bring prestige and honor to our family name. And it was then that I went into my dressing room. I sat down at the table, and I banged the brush on the table, and I shouted, no longer will I be the patient Griselda. I will be my own person. I will do what I want. I will do it when I want. I shall live an entirely different life. First, I will move out of the bedroom. I was a Victorian bride. To me, sex was for having children. And I was glad not to have any more. And so it was that I was to move to my own quarters and I was to throw away the marital responsibilities. I would be loyal to Franklin and I insisted that he make me another promise. He promised, Eleanor, I will never see or communicate with Lucy again. I accepted that and I began life on that day as 
Eleanor Roosevelt, an independent woman. I remember so vividly the year we went to our summer home in Campobello. Franklin had gone into the water and suddenly while he was swimming, he suddenly screamed, Eleanor, I cannot move my legs. We took him to shore. We called the finest doctors and he was diagnosed as having polio. And he was to get the best treatment available, but nothing seemed to help. I became the caring wife, and Franklin, who was determined to go on with his career, defied his mother again. She wanted him to be a country squire and not have a political career. Franklin, you can take care of the land, this land you love so much. But I insisted Franklin should not give up his dreams. And so it was that he was to go to the Northeast for regenerative kinds of treatments he was along the way to buy a little place in Warm Springs, Georgia, where the waters would help his legs to move just a little bit. And even his doctor, Dr. Draper, of whom history says very little, insisted Franklin must not give up his ambition. If he does, he will vegetate. And you, Mrs. Roosevelt, and he was speaking to Mama at the time, you must allow him to do what needs to be done. So Franklin's career sprouted forward and I was to become his eyes and ears and his feet who could move from place to place. I was to be sent out to go to hospitals to go to places of illness, to see what people needed in the way of care, in the way of food, in the way of help and assistance. And Franklin's good friend was to be my mentor. And the first thing he told me to join, the League of Women Voters, you will get your entree into politics, he said, and I did. I remember coming home one day and I ran up to Franklin and I said, Franklin, I did not know what to do at the meeting. What happened, he queried, and I said, they got into a controversy over a motion they were debating. Well, Eleanor, what happened? They started yelling at each other and nobody seemed able to come up with a solution. And then Franklin, I did what your mentor taught me to do. I made a motion to table the discussion for a future date. It was the most important information I had learned to this point. Franklin went on to become governor of New York. He went on to become 
a politician of the first order. And all along the way, he tried to improve his muscular strength. There was a time when Franklin felt the need to hire a social secretary for himself. And he hired a woman named Missy Lahand. Missy Lahand was to be his right hand person. It was she who took care of his correspondence. It was she who helped program his calendar. It was she who planned the functions he could attend. And it was she who went to New England when he was sent up there for special treatment and she stayed with him for months on end while he went through the treatment. Franklin felt very close to Missy Lahand, and I was not to know it, but history was to record that she, in her own way, deeply loved him and devoted her life to his. As Franklin went up the political ladder, I remember a nomination that took place in New York. He was introducing a candidate to be the Democratic nominee for president. And he had to come up to the podium to make his speech. His sons held him up on either side and it appeared he was walking and he made it to the podium. And that little walk convinced the public he was able to be physically independent. When the 1930s arrived and the country was in such a negative state, Franklin put forth all of the Roosevelt charm, influence, and as well as their finances. And he became a presidential nominee. Herbert Hoover, who had been president, was blamed for the Depression. And Franklin was looked upon as no blood, as something that would pull the country out of the doldrums. And even Mama Sarah campaigned for him. She would give luncheons at Springwood, their home, and teas. And she would never cease to talk about the wonders and brilliance of her son. As Franklin became president, I became the one who would do the traveling around the country to see what was needed. Franklin, I went today to St. Elizabeth's Hospital and I went into the kitchen and the steam was pouring out of the pots. Aren't you glad to know that these people were being fed. And Franklin looked at me and said, Eleanor, did you take the lids off the pots? That was the second most important lesson of politics that I learned. I would travel to the Dust Bowl I would travel to Appalachia. I would report on the horrors of the Depression. And I would start to leave Franklin little notes of things that could be done. I became 
the impetus for what was to become the New Deal. And I became the one who suggested the WPA, who suggested the need in the country for some kind of care for the elderly. And I found my own little niche and I realized I need to have someone to travel with me and be with me when I went around the country. I hired a woman named Lorena Hickok. Lorena Hickok was with me on a constant basis. We ate together, we slept together, we traveled together, we worked together. And as history began to be written, there were rumors that Lorena Hickok and I were lesbian lovers. That has never been definitively proved or disproved, but as so many future scholars would say, good for Eleanor. Whatever the true circumstances were, she deserved whatever happiness she could find. We traveled even to Canada, and I remember going to an inn, and we had to sign in, and I signed my name Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, not Mrs. Franklin Roosevelt. And I was looked at, are you by any chance related to the man who is president? And I remember telling the person at the desk, I am related to him, but he is Franklin. I am Eleanor, my own independent self. I was to build a little refuge for myself on the grounds of Hyde Park. And it was there that I would entertain my friends, many of whom were known lesbians. I would bring them there to spend months at a time or weekends just to have their company. And all of this time, Franklin was still enjoying the personal company of Missy Land. He also was being pursued by a cousin, Polly Delano, who would have given a limb to be accepted by Franklin. I knew about Polly, but what I didn't know was that through all these years, Franklin kept in touch with Lucy. As I left the White House to go on a mission, Lucy would come in by another door. She was known as Mrs. Johnson. And in later years, when records were made available, Mrs. Johnson came for dinner tonight, October 19th, and stayed for several days. I did not know anything about that at the time. As the New Deal evolved into World War II, I became Franklin's right-hand helper in what he wanted that I could be of help with. And there were other rumors that started with me. There were rumors that I was interested in a man named Adelaide Stevenson. And 
that I was having an affair with him. And Adelaide Stevenson told the press, I'm not having any affair with Eleanor Roosevelt. How can you call a woman you're having an affair with Mrs. Roosevelt? So he hushed up that rumor. I was also accused of having an affair with my bodyguards that were appointed to watch over me. Lorena eventually left me. She was ready for a career of her own. And I was left with a picture of her which every night I fondly kissed. I was also accused of being romantically involved with a sailor who was stationed in the Pacific. Oh, the rumors kept coming, but I could ignore them. And the question that arose during World War II was, where would I focus my talents? I became interested in the NAACP, and I was the one who, when Marian Anderson was told by the Daughters of the American Revolution that she could not do a concert at Constitution Hall, I with through my membership. I set up a concert for Marian Anderson to give. And when I went to the concert, I didn't sit on this side or this side. I sat right in the middle of the aisle. It became known that I was a lover of people of color. And one of those who criticized me repeatedly was a reporter, Westbrook Pedler. And I would spend my time devoted to my projects for humanity, for health, for care, for those who were not as fortunate as others. I became a columnist. I wrote a column called My Day. At first, it was a list of recipes that I suggested for a wartime White House. But eventually, it became politically suggestive for Franklin, and I would leave him additional copies telling him what I thought needed to be done. As time went on, I became a person to be noted. It was 1945. By that time, the war was winding down, and Franklin was going off for another meeting of world leaders. And wives were not to go to that meeting also. What was not known was that Franklin was ill when he went to that meeting. It was held in the Crimea because Stalin insisted he couldn't go too far from home. So Franklin, ill as he was, went to that meeting. And when he came home, his doctor had informed us that he was seriously ill. And maybe historians were later to say, maybe his illness was why Franklin gave away Eastern Europe at the end 
of World War II. As for me, I was busy with my grandchildren, and I was busy also with my own family. And I loved giving speeches to bolster morale, to cheer people up, to give them a purpose to point out the beauty of life. My life continued, and as time went on, Franklin was also to be romantically linked to a woman named Dorothy Schiff. She would come to Hyde Park, and she would visit for extended periods of time. One time, Franklin told me, Eleanor, I'm going to Warm Springs. I know you have your own work to attend to, but I am going to Warm Springs. Franklin loved it there. It was not for me. And Mama Sarah didn't like it there particularly either. I went off to do a luncheon. And in the middle of my talk at that luncheon, I received the phone call that Franklin had passed away. What I didn't know was that Lucy had been with him in Warm Springs at the time. She had arranged for a Madame Shomatov to paint his portrait. And in the middle of the painting, he had shouted, I have a terrible headache. And Franklin was to pass away. I came to Warm Springs as fast as I could get there. And Harry Truman was there. And it was Harry Truman who said, Eleanor, is there anything I can do for you? And I replied, Harry, is there anything I can do for you? You're the one who needs help right now. I would learn all about Lucy from Cousin Polly, who couldn't wait to tell me all about her. And I learned that Lucy had married a man named Rutherford. She had two estates. She had a daughter. Franklin never forgot the daughter's birthday. He stayed in touch with Lucy. The country knew it, for he traveled to his estate that he had in the middle of the country, and he would travel to her homes in New Jersey and South Carolina. And the officials would arrive to set up the area for a visit from the president. But no one spread the news. And no one realized that I had to plan a state funeral, tie up so many personal affairs, leave the White House, exit from public life, and at the same time, cope with the information that Franklin had lied to me and that he had been unfaithful. But I would adopt the attitude that so many historians picked up in later years. They debated the question, did Eleanor Roosevelt become what she became because of Franklin 
or rather in spite of him. It became a major debate question. I landed up estranged from my daughter, Anna. She had been the one who thought her father needed levity and humor. She had arranged Lucy's visits. And there were even days when Lucy would breeze into town for maybe just an hour or two, and where would I be? Maybe off in Rock Creek Park, where I would sit beside a statue and contemplate my life. I had written many books, and in the last one I was to write, I broached the subject Maybe Franklin should have married somebody less serious than I was. Maybe Franklin would have been happier with someone who could joke as he did. And maybe I shouldn't have been part of the picture at all. But I moved out of the White House. I took up residence in New York. Eventually, I made peace with my daughter, Anna, who was to take care of me. And if you were to ask me, Eleanor, what was the proudest moment of your life? I would say it was the moment when John Fitzgerald Kennedy had introduced me to the Assembly of the United Nations to read the Declaration of Human Rights. That was my greatest moment. Yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. Sincerely yours, Anna Eleanor Roosevelt Roosevelt. You can ask questions. Oh, good. You can ask questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody want to ask some questions, you could talk for another hour and a half on Eleanor and still not tell it all. But does anybody have a question? Do you have a question? You have a mic? Good. Anybody have something they want to ask? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You have a wonderful program and such lovely reception I got when we finally got here tonight. <laughs> thank you, Harriet, for making the arrangements, and thank you all for coming. What a delightful group. And I have to tell you, years ago, when I first started presenting programs, the first group I belonged to, which wasn't FAU as the first group, I belonged to a group called Odyssey. And my first lectures were given for a group of that name. So I feel honored tonight. Thank you all very much. I, I want to say thank you, too, and I hope you will join me in registering for a class at FAU, the next class that Myrna is going to present. I know I'll be there. Thank you again.